this session has no topic as such as unfiltered, so that's what it is. So expect some. We don't get chance to catch you know news anchors often, you know. So here is the uh, our our day to do that. Uh, first of all, you just had you, you just had three. No, no, I'm saying uh, we are grilling all of them today. So first, uh, so thank you so much for joining us, and I want to start with this context. Uh, you know hey, that uh, you are on the jury. I, I, uh, you saw some new talent. First of all, give me a sense of uh, where is journalism, journalism headed when you saw all those profiles and the, you know that are presented. Where are we? I think um, journalism is headed in absolutely the right direction. I the, the young people, you know, I'm young too, so I'm not going to exclude myself from that list. But uh, uh, some of the people that we saw, we heard. And the work, it was just phenomenal. And I think that uh, it was very, very tough to distinguish between uh, their capabilities. Uh, I feel that we're in very safe hands with this generation as long as um, we, we maintain the distinction between you know, fact and fiction. I think that's really fundamentally the most important part. And I think that all the individuals that, uh, in fact, all 80 or 90 individuals that were shortlisted uh, were phenomenally uh, uh, well versed in what they were doing, um, so it was very tough. But uh, on just the basis of that, I think uh, you know articulation, the use of language, perhaps even uh, their point of views, and I don't shy away from expressing them. Um, I think uh, this was a fabulous bunch, and it really inspires a lot of confidence. So, which brings me to my next question about: Okay, all that is fine, but what they are watching? Is a certain quality of discourse uh, that has a lot of critics. Uh, what do they do? I mean, the journalism that's been practiced, you know, a lot of critics are around, and we have this promising crop. So, are, are they torn between something which so is so ideal and which has been practiced? So you're talking about TV journalism in specific. Yeah. Look, I'm married to a critic. My own wife is my biggest critic. She comes from uh, um, the United States. She worked with the BBC, Reuters, very far removed from the sensibilities of her times now. Uh, and she finds uh, some of us extremely valuable, and I don't blame her. But as I said, I think every culture has its idiom of expression. We are a, I don't want to use the cliche argumentative democracy, this, that, the other, but we are a society that appreciates some amount of, uh, um, I suppose, uh, unfiltered, to use your word, commentary. Uh, the problem. And, and this is where we need to be extremely focused. The problem is when our rhetoric gets the better of us. I think that is an issue that needs to be looked at very closely, in especially the debate medium, because if that is happening, then you can't build a good argument or at least a convincing argument. Uh, the basis of every good argument is hard fact. Now you can interpret hard fact and look, just look around you. We're today competing with I think Rupain used that example of digital or what have you, and you know I'm not I'm not even on social media. I barely know how to tweet. Um, yeah, they're on Twitter. I I'm just i just about managed to start tweeting on my own. I don't know I used to use an interface. I'm not very proud of it. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Insta. I don't know what to do with them. I'm a bit of a crocodile, but nonetheless appreciate the fact that people have got a voice in this medium and can today actually put out a lot of things that mainstream media would miss. Um, now, when you're competing with that, you're looking at a very different beast because their commentary, uh, extending points of views, and also remember, there is very little formality. So, you know, a lot of us process the news first on WhatsApp. A lot of stuff is sent to us on WhatsApp. Uh, I'm talking about in our daily lives um, as, as normal citizens. We don't even switch on a TV, we don't even pick up a newspaper. So the first thing we get are forwards from friends, etc. And we're looking at them and we don't know if they're fact, if they're fiction, if they're a mix of two. And sometimes, some of us who are impressionable, less skeptical, will take them as gospel. Uh, at least mainstream media has some sort of regulation. It is self-enforced, uh, of course. We govern ourselves. We do. Uh, we are held up to certain standards, which are set, of course, for us uh, 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 through a process uh, which is quite inclusive. And therefore, 
there is a bit of a formality in uh, what we are doing. That there is an expectation that we verify facts and we don't put up fake news. Uh, as long as you are actually sticking to those basic rules, you can be as opinionated as you want. Newspapers are opinionated. Various digital websites have the news and they are opinionated. They have opinion columns. We swim between or in the great thing about a paper, for example, is that the first thing you look at on a paper is the news. Increasingly, news is also becoming editorialized because they are looking at not obviously being uh, you know, they're competing with digital, which has reported the news the day before or hours before they have. So, in your writing, you're going to editorialize, editorialize a lot. I, I remember working um, in a BBC newsroom where we couldn't even describe the person we were conversing with uh, because that was, you know, an editorial comment on their, you know, either their pulchritude or the demeanor, etc., and that good bias in some ways and influence the conversation. Today, you know, we've forgotten those basic uh, rules. Not that I'm a fan of that. I think that, uh, you know, you can build atmosphere into your piece and that's, this. I'm just taking a slightly more benign example, perhaps a more extreme one. But the fact is that um, I don't see why an anchor can't be opinionated. In fact, if you, like I do in my promo, I put out unapologetically that I have a point of view. Now, you can choose not to watch my show I set myself up for that. So I think, you know, we need to evolve with the manner in which we're also interlocuting with public. We've got Twitter now, you know, so we've had Twitter, I've woken up to its reality in the last two years. And I find a lot of people want to converse with you and you can choose to engage them. Or you can put up your point of view as long as it's uh, responsible and as long as it meets certain criteria, uh, which is fact-based, uh, you get out of it. But isn't mixing news and views a dangerous cocktail at the same time? Now again, uh, I don't think it's a dangerous cocktail because you are looking at television from a very, very prime time perspective where anchors sometimes with signature shows come on. And if you look at the West, I think, uh, not, not to say that the West is any ideal, but if you look at what has happened in the West where perhaps this style has been experimented with more in different formats, uh, this is quite derivial. The, the issue is when an anchor oversteps the mark, and most of us are guilty on a given day, uh, there are a few rare exceptions that don't, when you mix fact with fiction. So I can't sit there and start cooking up facts and then basing my opinion or my view on that. I must come up uh, with a expose of what are the facts. It's like being in a court of law. The two lawyers are doing pretty much the same charge sheet from different perspectives. I'm not talking about cherry picking. I'm talking about establishing the facts. You put the facts out there and then you say, well, these facts lead me to deduce this. What do you think? And as long as you're not muting the other side, I think uh, television shows are a lot more democratic than a large number of publications. I won't be published from my sort of uh, conservative point of view and a large number of publications in India, they won't even want me to write because there's consensus there. One of the biggest problems with uh, American democracy for a while, and you saw people like Noam Chomsky completely out of uh, the pale, was because it's a consensus-driven society. Their politics is now consensus-driven. There's a vast, vast middle. In the last five years, we've seen a you know, move away from that and they don't know how to deal with it. Uh, here in India, we've had many... Um, shape of opinion and it's important to reflect that and if a 20 minute or half an hour 45 minute one hour show can bring together several strands of the conversation i think that's a, a great thumbs up to our democracy as long as i said you don't mute out people right. uh, we're short on time i want to ask my last question and then take a couple of questions from the audience i know they are really waiting for it one is news looks same prime time looks similar everywhere why is it so? What are you doing to change it? Why? Yeah. Number two, somebody in the morning said that he uh, doesn't bother what the trolls say. Does it bother you? That's my second question. Uh, look, I'm a bit new to this game. I'm a very self um, absorbed sort of personality who doesn't really interact with a lot of people. I don't meet politicians at all. Uh, 
on a rare occasion when there's a background be briefing, I, I go. In fact, I'm not very particularly fond of meeting politicians. I'm, I'm not somebody who greets his bounds. I don't even meet fellow journalists. You'll probably never see me at any, you know, journalist parties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So obviously, I live in a cocoon, and the only feedback I get is from friends, family, and of course now increasingly through Twitter. I barely ever look at what the so-called trolls are saying. It doesn't matter to me because if someone can't meet an argument with another argument, I don't even consider them worthy of being bothered about. What does bother me is when someone points out that on a particular show, I might have transgressed some of the lines that I hold dear, which is a uh, fact. Uh, if I've put out the wrong fact, then that bothers me because uh, I think that uh, all of us as journalists have souls and uh, we all try, at least in the public interest, to do stories that uh, can change the discourse. For example, uh, there was a time, and I think it still remains quite valid for a large number of news organizations where, you know, sting journalism is sort of valorized and people go out there and do stings and all sorts of things. Now, I've put a ban on stings which don't serve the public interest. So as long as a sting serves the public interest, and manifestly so, uh, we won't do sting journalism. We don't even have an SIT team. Uh, we, we have a bunch of people who are editors or journalists who go out and uh, we want to, you know, perhaps carry out some sort of an investigation and that sort of dovetails into our sort of, you know, SIT, for the lack of a better word. Uh, just to differentiate ourselves from the usual uh, context in which we report. So I think that is, uh, uh, that is something that is important. So as I said, feedback uh, I get from uh, people who are close to me and I value those associations because I think those people are in touch. I just want to say that India is growing in Toronto not so much because uh, we have grating views which we shout at each other. I think we're growing in Toronto because we are not accepting of another point of view. So there's a massive cancel culture, which is, and I can tell you from, from, from my own living example, I've written several pieces and I have a column in the TOI and uh, I know for sure that some of the stuff that I write raises hackles of the establishment um, and uh, journalistic establishment, a particular set of people, and they don't like it and they would rather not have me uh, writing for those uh, pages. And I find that appalling because on times now we invite, we go out and say to political parties, their representatives, people on the other side of the spectrum come. There's a top intellectual uh, in the country who's also an author who will not appear on times now because he might find that some of the questions uh, might elicit responses for him that might expose uh, his lack of uh, balance. And I think that's uh, timidity and I think that's very wrong. And I think that just shows there's an intellectual insecurity. If you can't stand and um, uh, stand toe to toe with somebody and argue a point, then I'm sorry, you're not an intellectual. I think uh, we have time for two quick questions. Really short of time. Uh, yes, please. Right. Can I get the mic? Sir, uh, sir can I you please wait for a mic to come to you? Just one second. Sir, as you told that, I do agree with your point when you uh, tell that. Uh, anchors can be opinionated, but uh, I think that anchors have the privilege of getting the largest, uh, the major screen time. So if they are opinionated in one direction, is not that problematic? Yeah, that's what I said. I added a caveat: as long as you a remain faithful to facts, so you present the other side of the argument. Look, uh, if there is a story, you know, demolition, etc. There are always two points of view. There will be some people who will come out and say that these people weren't given due notice. You might have another side that says, like the municipal corporation, that oh, we sent them an order a month ago, this, that, the other. Now, if you choose to mute one side which says, well, no due process was served here, and you only present the SDMC or whatever you want to call it, the municipal corporation, North Corporation, whatever it is, it's their point of view, and then you begin to expound and say, Dekya, many bataya, this is you know a legitimate exercise. Then you're doing a disservice. If you say that two points of view, now you can take this, uh, you can you can you obviously put them out there, and then you say, Well, having acknowledged these facts, we can still say 
X, Y, or Z. And that's up to you and, and, and the way you sort of interpret. But as long as the viewer is very clearly told that there are two sides. Second, most importantly, there will be another side on your panel that will express a dissenting point of view, if from you, that is. And if you cancel that point out, then there is obviously imbalance, endemic imbalance in your show. Thirdly, which is something that I would like to reflect upon, uh, I think people need to be a little more mature about accommodating another point of view which may not actually concur with your own. A lot of people who come to Times Now, perhaps, and this is why I think they do, is to interlocute with the point of view that they don't hear on any other channel. Uh, now, you might be very niche or you might be quite broad. Today, unfortunately, if you, I believed in certain things, certain principles, for 25 years, and I have a body of work. I went for an interview to a leading media company when I was about 28, and they said, you're too right for us, i.e. right of center, and I was stunned. It didn't dawn on me, I was too young to process it. And when I look back on it, I was basically canceled. Now, what I'm trying to say is, and, 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 and that, ironically, is a, is a media organization that prides itself in being democratic and open. And when I look at it, and I begin to process what I hear from that portal or from you know the company, I sometimes try to square their point of view on air with what I've experienced. I hope they've graduated to be more accommodating, but it's mature. It shows maturity if you interlocute with another point of view and you allow it to subsist. So as long as an anchor allows for that, you're okay. And you're telling the viewer up front, sorry to paraphrase Malcolm Shaw's name, uh, that you have a point of view, so you're going to express it. What is your most happy moment of being in journalism? Well, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I think when you get up every morning, you feel excited about the news. I think I'm really happy about being excited about my job. I think that we do the best job in the world, quite frankly. You are exposed to so much. You learn so much on a daily basis. You're not just staring at a spreadsheet. Uh, I would love to if I had my own business, but I don't. Um, and I'm sure that brings people joy when they see the numbers going up. But uh, look, I think when you get up every morning, there's a fresh story. There's something new to learn, something new to understand, something new to get your head around, and you're rejuvenated every day. I think I'm, I'm being now extremely politic by saying this because, you know, I really can't single out anything that made me superlatively happy. I think the transition uh, from uh, print to TV for me uh, was something I had to do. Uh, do I enjoy it thoroughly television? Not really. I don't even like to be on air actually. How to do it, it's a job. Um, I'm thinking of taking a, a break from it in fact. That's uh, a news. news. Yeah, yeah. news. Um, and I'm trying to sort of move towards something. Do you think I can take your place? Absolutely. It's it's easy. Easy. You just ask oh. everyone, they think we just do rubbish. We do a podcast and we go in. Exactly. But, but, uh, what is your most embarrassing moment on TV? Oh, I have to say that uh, recently uh, I starred in, in a duel uh, and I didn't know the identity of the person I was speaking with. And just the other day I was at this forum, which is the Times Forum in Bombay, uh, McAdams. Um, and there was this young gentleman, a uh, young young man, perhaps as old as the gentleman who asked me the question back there, and he came up to me and there was a young girl and they said, we want to take a photograph with you, we really like your show, we watch your show, and I said, great. I pulled off my mask and I stood next to this guy and he looked at me and the moment they were going to click the photo, he says, by the way, I just, I just died laughing. <laughs> and, and I looked at this guy and I said, um, you know, uh, even I do crack up when I watch that. And so I think... You know, embarrassing in the sense that um, I did set myself up for that, didn't I? Uh, people have often asked, what have you done to the producer? I'm sure you, you know, gave the producer a hard time. Uh, I have to say that uh, I came in and I was, in fact, I realized that this was probably going to go a little viral. So I told them immediately, don't put it out on Twitter, okay? <laughs> don't put this clip out on Twitter. But it went off on YouTube. I didn't even know we were live on YouTube. Can you imagine who puts a show which is going live on TV, live on YouTube, you're killing your viewership. But it did. And of course, it went crazy. So I went to the producer and I said, guys, 
It's fine. You set me up. <laughs> but don't. At least don't throw me to the wolves before I before I knew it. What is the one news media person you look up to, and why? Well, that's a tough question. And uh, look, there are several. I uh, I'm really a man of letters. I like writing. I love writing. I think I've worked with a couple of very good um, editors who are experts at the English language. Um, I think uh, uh, Dilip Padgamka was phenomenal. Uh, Jack, I think I worked under him. Sinhat Vartaraj. Yes. Um, Jyotirmoy um, uh, Sharma. Jyotirmoy no, Sharma, uh, who's now gone into academia. Good for him. Um, I think um, I think my own uncle Karan. I think he's an exceptionally good journalist. Um, you know, you can disagree with his politics, but you know that's the way it is uh, today. Um, as long as uh, you know everyone sort of retains a certain fidelity to fact, it's okay. I'm talking about the craft here. Okay, I'm not Absolutely. talking about opinion. So Absolutely. you know, I, I liked um, uh, for a long time. I thought that uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, uh, one other particular uh, writer I'm really fond of, Rod Little. I read The Spectator, I've been reading it for like 25 years. I think Rod Little's work has really influenced me. Um, his irreverence, his typical British turn of phrase, I think it's phenomenal. A. A. Gill, um, as journalists go, a fantastic body of work. Um, I do read the National Review and I think a uh, spectacularly curated and written magazine. The National Review, set up by one of the greatest um, in uh, commentary. So I think these guys really. Yeah, have I can see that you haven't taken any new TV journalist in or a current journalist. No, I did. Um, you know, I've talked about uh, current, for example. Um, I, I like the way he sort of sets oh. himself up. So I don't agree with him. We don't. Uh, we're we're on completely radical ends of the political spectrum. I think I've even been cancelled in the family, but that's okay. Um, that doesn't still, you know. So um, I think Rajdeep. Uh, was good. Vikram uh, was fantastic when he goes on air. Bhatka was. Please give them a big round of applause. Give them a round of applause to Rahul for being even in era we don't you you don't uh, really applaud your contemporaries or for various reasons. I think just doing that. That's what forty was. I think you know we're we're a big family. You know we compete with each other, but I think at the end of the day you've got to retain your soul. Uh, you've got to be able to get up in the morning and appreciate the others because if you don't, then you're a megalomaniac. And I think anyone in media, you know, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> there are several of them. You won't give the name now. Next conversation. Invite on Saturday news next. That's a promo for it. But uh, okay, my last two questions. Uh, one person outside news media and media that you look up to, not for the just height. I mean, like I look up to Kali the wrestler. Like five five feet more tall than me. Not five feet more. Tall. Look, I mean, you know. Look, I mean, where do you start? India is full of one person, two people, one. Um, I suppose you know. Uh, look again, this could turn controversial, but I think uh, I've sort of read a lot of Dean Diarapatya. I think he was uh, a phenomenal mind, very good for Indian politics, actually. Um, I think uh, uh, you've had. Uh, you know, I'm not really enamored by Mr. Nehru. Um, I used to be at one time. Mahatma Gandhi is someone, obviously, that you would, you know, uh, have uh, uh, respect for. But again, I'm not blind to the critique of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, but I think overall, I, I have to say that there are certain voices that speak up, you know, to speak out to you. They reach out, they influence your mind. And I think I'm more... You know, I'm not somebody who watches much cinema, etc., etc. So don't expect me to go. You know, sure. Uh, you give me at least specific name. My last question to you: yeah. If you had to forecast one trend for media that we still haven't kind of got our hands around, or uh, we, it hasn't been talked since morning, we can talk about some of the changes. We can talk about some of the changes. Rajdeep Sonia talked about. So one trend that we are not yet focusing a lot on. One prediction. Well, I think that uh, I'm going to keep this uh, a slightly preachy. I think we need to really come together as a medium, as professionals. I think there's just too much, you know, uh, backbiting that goes on. 
And I think that does a disservice because I find that we can't unify on some of the more important issues. And I think people can take advantage of that. And a severely divided media is not good for uh, country. country. All so I think if, if I were to advocate anything, look, you can come up with n number of technical fixes, you know, to, to plow a different sort of, you know, you know, a trend in a particular field. But I think, uh, I don't know when was the last time uh, 20 top journalists cutting across opinion, shades of opinion, sat in one room and actually had an honest conversation. I think what we really need is truth and reconciliation in the media. And if Royal you know what to do, right? <laughs> if you haven't heard it, you know, my friends who really know me will try and do that and try and do that. You know, I, I, uh, there, there is an industry body and, and, and there is such hostility in that industry body. I know the name, four letter word. And, <laughs> um, and you know, it shocks me because uh, at the end of the day, you're just contesting ideas, hopefully, not agendas. And if you are allowed to an agenda, that's that. You shouldn't be in journalism. But as long as you're contesting ideas, I think we should be mature enough to sit together and you know, have conversations. Just before I let you go, your viewpoint on the ratings. Look, um, first of all, there's, and, and you know, I speak my mind. I think there were certain expectations of, uh, uh, you know, the agencies. And I don't think all of them have been fulfilled. Uh, so, I'm very, very, very trepidatious about the fact that the system is still open to uh, the prospect of another scandal. Are there your headlines? Multiple headlines. Yeah. Uh, so, Rajiv keep saying he'll retire soon. Uh, Sonia says Rajiv has been saying this for 20 years. <laughs> and now Rahul says whatever he has said about rating. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, um, that fills me with a little bit of apprehension. Now, look, I, I don't want to blow Times Now's trumpet and this, that, the other, but the release of the ratings has uh, put us right on top of the heap where I thought we always were. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, uh, this was my doing or the present team's doing. I think Times Now as a brand has been put up there and uh, the credit goes to everyone who actually served that channel and the enterprise, uh, past, present, and hopefully future. So I think that's that's uh, important, but I do feel that uh, while we can sort of revel in that, you know, I think what the rating system does is uh, it sometimes pushes you into taking decisions that are tailored more for the taste of an audience Right, and that's a constant and perennial struggle. Now, many people say if you can't handle it, leave the kitchen. Um, obviously, you have to, and you have to, under even those constraints, um, continue to do the job so that you can, you know, sleep well with a clear conscience. I think that uh, Bath needs to evolve uh, into, 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 uh, into uh, a system. I don't think Bath will hit legal notices from them very often. So oh, so you're saying that. I'm speaking on your platform. You know, so I get people who may or may not you no, I, I think, But the I fact of this, has everything that was raised has been addressed? No. Has the manipulation and uh, manual intervention, has that been addressed? No one knows. I, don't I mean, know. I don't know. So, I just hope it has. Look, the report um, is yet to be, I think, made public, if I'm not mistaken, on the scandal. Now, look, I'm happy to open to my... Uh, no, they, they're not sharing uh, so clearly not with us. So it's not with us. So um, it would have been nice to see it. Yeah, do they have an internal panel that they want to release? And there's a report of that on how those issues that were raised by the industry have been fixed. So clearly that's what Rahul is referring to. Yeah. Clearly, so, Rahul, I think uh, I you and me are on the same page at least on that. It may have been fixed. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, look. As I said, I hope it has been fixed. One expects it to have been fixed. I don't think anyone would want to subject themselves once again to that kind of scrutiny, uh, least of all Bach. Uh, but uh, frankly, you never know. You know, there are desperados out there. Thank you so much. Give Rahul Shishadra and Rohit.